thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the third class of the series, and it's like the most exciting one for me. <laughs> uh, and it's about the implementation, the real implementation of uh, parametric models or models in general. We will be doing this an uh, introduction because it's an uh, extensive topic. But uh, after this presentation, uh, you will have the uh, some insights to to perform this. Uh, tasks. So, well, you know me. My name is Sergio Peñafiel. I'm a master's student from the University of Chile. Um, yeah, and today we will be uh, reviewing the types of machine learning models because they are different uh, types and we will be uh, talking about one of them. Uh, then we will be talking about automatic differentiation, which is something that I said in the last presentations. Uh, and it's the um, uh, mathematical framework that allow us to produce these uh, methods. We will be talking about gradient descent, of course, and uh, we will be implementing, or trying to implement, uh, two different parametric models. The uh, first one is a linear regression, a simple, the simplest uh, parametric model. And the next is um, a simple version of the denser Schaeffer uh, classifier, right? So, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, in the field of machine learning and supervised learning, we have um, uh, two types of um, models, depending on how the model learn or uh, what we um, think about the, the learning of the models. And the separation is in parametric models and non-parametric models. Parametric models are the ones that uh, follow some mathematical modeling of the problem. So you, uh, you see that the, um, the output is defined by a mathematical expression that combines input values with and other values that need to be adjusted that are called parameters. So parametric models are like following a mathematical expression of the problem, uh, combining these two inputs and other uh, numbers that are need to be adjusted. Uh, these parameters are adjusted by looking at the training um, set and applying some techniques to find the optimal values, for example, minimizing the, the loss. And non-parametric models are models that use all the data, the training set, uh, to build a structure, and a data structure. Uh, for example, we have decision trees, which are non-parametric because when you have your data set, you produce this decision tree with a procedure, uh, and, it, uh, and it is a tree, right, a binary tree, so um, it doesn't have these values that need to be adjusted. Uh, the same go for, for example, for k nearest neighbors, then where you have all the uh, training sets and you look to the nearest one for a record, uh, then you don't, need, you don't have parameters there, or, uh, neither. Um, and so, so we will be talking in this presentation about the first one, the parametric models, uh, because they are the most flexible models in a certain way. Uh, they have gained some interest in last uh, years because of the deep learning. All of deep learning models are parametric models. And um, because we have no tools to, um, to produce these models more um, easier than before. So uh, we will be talking about these parametric models. And to optimize the values of, the, um, of these uh, parametric models, we need to uh, use gradient descent. Yeah? And gradient descent is um, a, a procedure to a, a, a change a value according to the derivative of some uh, function, right? And um, to do that, we need automatic differentiation, which is something that I've uh, been saying uh, a lot. 
So for automatic differentiation, we here's an example. For example, we have uh, this expression, which is in the last row. And uh, uh, no, sorry, the, the expression is x squared times, oh, sorry. Um, Sorry. <laughs> it's the remote of the picture. Where? <laughs> Where? Ah, here? No. <laughs> I don't know. Ah, here. Right. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, so this is, maybe this. Yeah. Yeah, sorry for the technical difficulties. Well, okay. <laughs> so, um, this is an expression tree for a mathematical expression. The mathematical expression, you can uh, follow the tree to the leaves and see how they are combined. For example, this one is x squared times y plus e, and here we have the exponential of x plus the uh, logarithm of y, right? So this is the expression, uh, for, uh, uh, an example of one, one expression, and we would like to know which is the derivative of this expression with respect to both variables, which x and y. So, uh, to do that, automatic differentiation builds this table, which is the, an expression table that combines uh, one uh, expression with uh, at a time, I mean. Uh, so uh, to build this table, you have to um, go through this uh, tree to the leaves and make like a um, DFS process. Uh, the first, if you go all the way back here, the first that you find is x squared, right? And you call this uh, e1, right? And as you know, the, the value of x, which is two, in the, uh, you can compute this at this point, right? So you know this is four. And then uh, if this is called e1, you can replace all of this subtree with e1, and then you find e1 times uh, y, which is exactly the next ex expression in the tree. And uh, as you know the value of e1, which is here, uh, you know the value of y, you can compute uh, the value of e2, right? And in each step, uh, you only need to do one computation uh, to build the, um, uh, the stable and the numerical value of the expression, right? Uh, we can compute continue the, the, the process, for example, then you need to uh, go to this, uh, this is the next leaf in the tree, right? Uh, which is the exponential of x, right, this one. Uh, you can compute the value, assign it to uh, E3, then you have E3 here. The next leaf is there, which is the, um, uh, the E4, right? And then you have uh, this two, e3 plus e4, and then you have your final uh, uh, node, which is this one, all of this one, which is e2, right? And all of this one, which is e5. And then you compute this table, right? So this is evaluation of an expression. We don't use any derivative here. But you can compute this table. This table is the important thing about uh, automatic differentiation. So what you can do with this table, this is the same table that as before, uh, you can compute the derivative with respect to one of the variables for all of these expressions, right? And following the derivative rules, the chain rule and, and others, uh, you can compute this, the, the values. For example, if you take 
the derivative of E1 with respect to X. Uh, you know that E1 is X squared, so the derivative is 2X, uh, DX over DX, which is one. And uh, as you know, the value of X is two, you know this is four, right? And uh, in the same way, you can um, compute the derivative of E2 by looking at this, applying the multiplication rule of derivative, which says that it's the derivative of the first one times the second one plus the first one times the derivative of the second one. And all of these values, you uh, know the, um, their values, right? Because uh, this is exactly what we compute in the, in the first row, which is four. We can replace it with four. Y is three, E1 is here, is four, and dy dx is zero. So uh, you have all, when you compute this table, you have all the values that you need to, uh, uh, to replace in the symbolic expression to get the numerical value, right? So this is the procedure. If you follow this, you will find the derivative of E6 with respect to X, which is the derivative of the whole expression. And, uh, and then the numerical value here is the one that you are looking for, right? So it's very, uh, uh, very straightforward uh, procedure. So when you compute this table in this order, you can compute this derivative for, with respect to X again, and then you have your numerical result there. If you want to do this for Y, you will have to do the same, uh, but replacing Y in every step, right? Uh, and the procedure is the, is, the, is the same. This is called the forward uh, automatic differentiation because you start with uh, one expression. Of, you, you start from the E1 to the E6, right, in this order. So you follow the natural order of doing this derivative, but there is another uh, possibility, which is uh, called the backward automatic differentiation, that you start by looking the derivative of f, f is the, the whole expression, uh, with respect to their expressions, and you go back uh, with respect to x, e6, c5, f4, f3, f2, e1, and then with respect to x or y, right? You, you follow this uh, in the backwards direction, and, um, and usually this is much, uh, much more simpler, uh, because if you, the first one is always one, because you are deriving the, the whole expression with respect to the same, this is one, right? The next one, uh, you have to separate this uh, depending on the um, uh, on when uh, E5 is uh, contained in this table, right? E5, if we found it here, is in E6. So we need to compute the derivative of F with E6 times the derivative of E6 with respect to E5. And if you look at this expression, this is one we know from the uh, last row of the table, and if you look at this expression, uh, if you have this E6, which is this formula, and you are trying to derive uh, this uh, function with respect to this variable, this is one, also. so you have this as uh, one. And if you follow this, you may uh, notice that most of the values are ones after you reach uh, like one, uh, expression that combines with a variable, which is this one, for example, uh, where you will find the derivative of this is y, right? Um, and then when you, when you reach this step and you have all of this information, you can compute the derivative of x with respect to x using the same procedure. You look at this table where x is, uh, where x appears, which appears in E1 and E3. So you compute the derivative with respect to E3, E3 with respect to the x, and then f with respect to E1, E1 with respect to x. And all of these values, you know in advance from this table. So this is uh, one, right, this. And 
e3 with respect to x, well, you have to compute this is e to the x, right? Then this f with respect to e1 is 3 from this, and e1 with respect to x is 2x, right? And then if you compute this, you will find the, the same answer as before, which is e squared plus 12, right? This one. So this is a, maybe for a human, it's more difficult, <laughs> but for a machine, it's easier because many of the uh, values that you are working uh, with are ones. And when you reach this, you only have to do one more step to uh, get the value of the, um, of the derivative that you are finding. For example, if you need to know the derivative of x with respect to y, you don't need to do this all again because all of this doesn't depend on the variable. You only need to do this step. So it's also faster. Uh, this algorithm is like, n times m, if we uh, uh, call this uh, the number of rows n and the number of parameters m, uh, and this is n plus m, so it's linear and easier to compute. So this is backward automatic differentiation. I, I don't expect you to, to understand all the mathematics behind, but to only have an insight to what the models are doing and why this is uh, working and why it's faster. So, so having this, uh, we have a procedure. So to, to the compute derivatives of any expression, we can compute derivative for uh, an expression that we define uh, that are, will be our model's um, parameters, for example. And as I said before, we will be using gradient descent. And gradient descent is basically this formula, which states that the the next value of a parameter, yeah, the if x is a parameter, the next value of a parameter is the previous value uh, minus uh, some uh, factor. And this factor is the derivative of, the, of one function, which we will be calling the loss, uh, and multiplied by a factor which is called the learning rate, right? And in this, uh, for example, in this chart, you will see if you apply this formula several times, uh, and this is like the plot of the loss function uh, in the c-axis. Uh, then, if you start here, the this and applying this formula several times, you will find your path to one of the minimums in this uh, function. So, um, it means that uh, every time you apply this formula, you will have a, a lower loss which is what we expect. But um, the problem with that is that it's very dependent to this value, to the alpha value. So here are three values for the learning rate. So if we um, use a value of a learning rate very low, which is the blue line, we, we will see practically no difference in loss we, it's erratic, but it's mostly constant. So the, the loss isn't uh, decreasing. Um, if you, if uh, we select a value of a loss very high, which is the green line, we will see these uh, like random behaviors on the loss where you can reach very low uh, loss in, in, in little epochs, but after that, the loss can grow and go down. It's very random. And uh, if you find a, a learning rate just right, which is the uh, orange line, uh, you will see this, which is a typical uh, loss reduction function, which goes down, maybe up sometimes, but in general, uh, it follows uh, this uh, decreasing pattern, right? Um, the problem is, um, how can I know which value of the learning rate I, I need to use, right? Because if, uh, as you can see, if I select it wrong, we maybe we will have a, a good model, but the model, it's not uh, learning, it's not converting to the optimal values. So for that, we have 
uh, what we call optimization method. Yeah, and we have uh, many optimization methods, but the idea of the optimization methods is to extend the uh, gradient descent formula to applying some other uh, uh, factors that uh, reduce the risk of having a bad uh, learning rate, right? In this case, uh, RMS prop, which is stands for root mean square prop, um, is a, a procedure that follows the same idea of updating the value with the previous value plus a, a value that depends on the derivative but it holds these uh, expressions, which are these ones, that uh, also depends on the second derivative of the loss. Which uh, this is one of the most uh, accurate optimization methods. But the problem is that you have to compute an extra uh, derivative, which is not uh, so cheap in computation. So it is good, but uh, it's expensive. And another one uh, which follows the same like idea is uh, Adam optimization model, um, which is a little bit simpler than RMS prop, but also requires to compute the second, um, I, I mean, the um, um, another uh, derivative. Here we have uh, other parameters to control the, the convergence of the model. And uh, sometimes this is uh, the, the, the way to. But uh, for our examples, we will stand with a naive gradient descent um, for now, yeah? So uh, this class will be also, um, a, we will have an, an implementation here, not just theoretical things. So uh, to do automatic differentiation, we have many alternatives. Uh, I use the Torch library, which is the um, provided by uh, the PyTorch team, which is one of the main um, uh, machine learning frameworks to build models. You probably have used it to build neural networks or anything, but uh, Torch in the low, low level uh, have automatic differentiation implemented. So, uh, for example, just to, 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 to know how to use it, uh, we can have a, an expression, a simple expression, for example, this one, which is a squared plus 3b, um, uh, where a and b are parameters. We, and we would like to know which is the dq and d over da and dq dv. Uh, for a equal to and b equal one, right? So, uh, how to do that in Torch? Uh, we need to define a tensor. A tensor is like a uh, multidimensional matrix, right? But it can be a value also in in zero dimensions. So, uh, we can define uh, these tensors uh, and assign the values uh, that we are interested in, uh, which is two and one, right? And if you pass this flag, this uh, requires grad parameters, it, al it will trigger the, all the um, automatic differentiation stuff. So if we see this, uh, we can see that we have a tensor with two, a tensor with one, and both are with gradient uh, on, with gradient computation on. Then we can define our, our or expression, right, which is here, uh, which is a squared plus 3b, and of when, uh, if we apply this, we see that this is seven, of course, if you def replace the values you have uh, for plus three. And uh, the interesting thing about this is that it also has a gradient, which is the second parameter, uh, but instead of this, which has the, the requires grade two, which are called the leaves of, or the variables, they have a gradient function, yeah? And the gradient functions tells uh, this uh, tensor how to 
uh, compute the derivative backwards, right? In the using the second uh, alternative that we have. So we can compute the derivative of Q uh, using this, the backward uh, method. Um, we need to pass a direction, that's a, but it is one. And after that, the value of the derivative are stored in the leaf nodes in the grad uh, property. So if we look at A that grad, uh, I and B grad, we found this four and three. And uh, if we compute the derivative dq over dA, uh, remember that Q is here, uh, you will find that dq dA is two A, right? And A is two, so this is four, which is okay. And the QDB is just three, right? Which is here and it's also okay. We can compare them. This is the composition, yeah, and you find four and three. So this is a basic example to know that we can compute uh, derivatives with automatic differentiation very easily uh, using torch. You only need to define which variables uh, are the leaves known, the, the parameters that you're interested in computing the derivatives with respect to, and then you use this backward uh, method, and all uh, happens in, uh, all the differentiation happens in uh, behind, right? Uh, and this can, could be any, any, any uh, expression, and you will find uh, the derivative uh, with respect to the variables with no problem, right? Well, uh, having this, we can uh, use this XR uh, to uh, create uh, parametric models, right? And this is the second part. Uh, we will be implementing a linear regression using this uh, automatic differentiation um, alternative, right? Uh, so for that, we will be using, uh, like, this is... Um, uh, we are defining some uh, toy uh, data set. Uh, we have x, which ranges from minus, minus 10 to 10, and y is um, this line, which is 2x minus 1, and we apply some random noise uh, to, to this uh, distribution. So after that, we have this, which um, are points, but they are clearly following one line here, right? Um, so, yeah, in linear regression, we know that the, the expression for a linear regression is that. It's that uh, the output is the, um, the input multiplied by some constant, and uh, we add some bias, right? And A and B are the numbers that we don't know are the parameters of the model, the, uh, we will start with random values, for example, or fixed values, and we will apply the procedure of derivative, the loss, uh, computing the gradient uh, descent, and update the values to know if they converge to the optimal value. So we can do that by uh, using the same as before. We uh, define A and B to be to tensor that requires the gradient computation, we can start with a fixed value of one or a random value, it doesn't matter. And we can compute the uh, expression for the linear regression, which is this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the next um, thing that we need is to compute the loss, yeah? And the loss is the measure on which our model differs to the real um, output. So one, there are many loss functions, but one of the most used one is the mean square error, yeah? And the mean square error is defined uh, by the, the distance square uh, from the uh, output and the real value. Um, taking the average of all these points. So you, this is the formula. It's like a, a subtracting uh, or computing the difference between your 
uh, prediction and the real one. Maybe we can see which are Y and YR to be more clear. Y is the is this array, which are the values that are plotted in this chart, right, in the y-axis. Um, and yr is our linear regression, this expression right here, uh, which is also an array, but other values because we have these uh, fixed uh, numbers that are not uh, okay. So we can compute the loss by computing the difference between these two arrays, uh, squaring them, and taking the, the mean, the average. And this outputs a value, right? And right now, the loss is 39. That it's a high value for the loss. Uh, but we would like to, to decrease this value uh, as much as possible, right? But the interesting thing is that as we are uh, making these uh, expressions, we start from these uh, variables that are leaves that require gradient. We did mathematical expression, and here is another mathematical expression. We uh, keep the, the gradient. So this tensor not only has this value, it also has how to um, compute the derivative of this uh, expression with respect to A and B. So that's exactly what we do in the same. In the next uh, cell, we can compute the backward of the loss, just, in, just like the previous example. When we compute the, uh, uh, the gradient of Q, we can compute the gradient of the loss easily. And then in A grad and B grad, we have uh, these two tensors. So what uh, this is telling to us is that these values here, uh, A which is one and B which is one, if you follow the, the gradient descent, you will need to uh, uh, increase the value of A because this is negative and decrease the value of B, right? To, to adjust to better, uh, to better, um, optimal values for the model. Um, that's what we can do here, right? So we can use this information, the A grad and B grad, to, uh, and using a learning rate, um, in this case we are using this uh, learning rate, uh, to compute the, um, the new values for A and B. So the new value for A and B is A minus the learning rate times the gradient, which is the formula of gradient descent, and we did it, do this for these two, and after that, uh, you have new values for A and B. This is 1.06, right, and this is 0 0.99, uh, which are a little bit different from the ones that we start with, these ones, uh, but they should uh, be better. Uh, that means that the loss should be loss, less. So if we compute the loss again, we compute the, the linear regression with the new values, the loss for the new values, uh, we end up with a 35, we start here with 39, right? So we um, actually decrease the loss by four points uh, using just one iteration of the gradient descent. And we can, uh, do this again. I mean, uh, we can compute the derivative, the gradients. Now these times are different. Uh, and we can uh, repeat this many times. Here is a, a for loop that does the previous steps uh, 200 times. Maybe we can start with uh, 20 just to print the loss. So if we see that uh, we are applying the same procedure several times and the loss is uh, plot, uh, printed here and the loss start to uh, decrease and after all of this we have these values for A and B, right? Which are, uh, uh, they have changed. If we plot um, these uh, values, 
we have like, uh, this is, are the points, the blue dots uh, of the data set, and the orange line is the, or linear regression. Um, it start to uh, resemble the, the, the shape of the, uh, of the data set, but not quite. I mean, the best line start maybe here and go, go there. So, uh, we can, uh, that's because the optimal values have not converged. As you can see, the loss is always decreasing here. And we can do this, so 200 times, it doesn't matter. Or another 200 times if you like, <laughs> another. Uh, and then, uh, this is a better uh, line to approximate these, these values, right? But you can repeat this a lot, a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, and you will find, yeah, this is like the, the one of the most accurate um, lines for this, right? So, and if you can see the last values of A and B, which is are there, uh, 1.91 and minus 1.03, are very similar to the ones that create the distribution in the first time, right? Uh, we will expect A to be two and B to be minus, minus one, and they are close to that value, right? This. So the, the model have, uh, using this procedure, which is the same as I, I showed you in the presentation, we can find, actually find the optimal values of a model, which is, this is a very simple model, two parameters, but uh, uh, we can find them, right? That's, a, that's a, the, the idea of uh, all of this procedure. Yeah, so, uh, now yeah, that you know uh, how to uh, define a uh, uh, parametric model using these param parameters and uh, one function, how to compute the loss, and how to apply the gradient descent, uh, we can move forward to the uh, classifier implementation of the Dempster Shepherd classifier implementation. But in order to do that, we need to review some terms of the uh, dempster Schaeffer theory um, that we um, uh, are, uh, uh, that we need. So the first one is that uh, we have mass assign functions, right? The mass assign functions go from this power set of one, the outcomes to zero, one. The mass of the null set is zero, and the sum of all the subset m must be one, right? That's, uh, this is what we uh, see in the first presentation, or in the second one, I guess. Uh, this is new, which is the uh, pignistic transformation. I said in one of the lectures that mass assigned function can be transformed to probability distribution. And we have many different transformations. One of these, uh, one of them are uh, the pignistic transformation, which is uh, this formula right here that you take the mass of a subset and uh, you divide it by the, by the length of this subset, but how many items it has. Uh, you sum all of the subset that contains uh, an outcome, and this is the probability. Uh, distribute, right? Uh, and the final thing that we need to define is the Dempster rule. This is the combination rule that I, I uh, told you um, or I mentioned um, that allows you to combine two different uh, mass assign functions. So if you have the M1 and M2 masses, uh, you can combine them. Uh, using this formula, first you need to calculate this constant k, uh, which is the mass uh, the, of all the subset that doesn't match, the, the intersection is null. Uh, you multiply them, you sum all of them, and then you have your uh, conflict coefficient, which is k. And when you have k, uh, you can compute the Dempster rule, which is, um, the multiplying all of the subset that 
intersects to the to your uh, interest uh, set. So uh, in in this case, the formula may seem a little bit uh, uh, long and and strange, but what it does is uh, you multiply the mass of the certainty with the certainty of the the other set, or you must the you multiply the mass of the certainty of M1 with the uncertainty of M2. And you sum all of these things, right? It's, uh, that's the idea behind the, the Dempster rule. And, um, and we can implement uh, these things in our implementation. So, uh, the classifier implementation we will be uh, reviewing here is a very simple one. It's not the one that is implemented in the uh, in the library, um, but it uh, showed you the, the 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 first steps, right? So the first one is to to know how to represent this mass assigned function, right? A mass assigned function will be an array, at least, and with uh, if we have n different options, the array will be n plus one. And the first n will be the mass of the singleton, the certainty that we have for each uh, uh, value. And the last one will be the uncertainty. Yeah. And here we have uh, different um, um, functions that allows us to make some, some computation. The first one is to create a random mass assigned function yeah, of a length k uh, with some uncertainty. That it simply, uh, as you can see here, it simply uh, make random values for for all the the, uh, the array except for the last one that is uh, fixed to the uncertainty value that we have uh, there, and it output this as a tensor, right, which uh, has the gradient uh, on, like in the in the previous example. So, uh, for example, we can be go viewing this. Um, if we call this function, create mom random mass assigned function k, it would be output this tensor, a four length tensor, which random values for the first three ones that are the classes. This is the certainty for the class one, this is the certainty for class two, this is certainty for class three. And this is the uncertain. The last value is the uncertain, right? And um, it uh, just um, an array with a gradient on. We can, uh, for example, use a higher value of uncertainty. Then these are uh, lower, right? Uh, this uh, allows us to create a random mass assign function, right? Which can be the starting point for the model. Uh, the next one is this function, the Dempster rule, and this uh, computes the Dempster rule. The same formula that I presented you in the, in the slides is here, yeah. Uh, as, we, as I said before, uh, you only need to uh, multiply the certainty of the two uh, masses. Uh, and the uncertainty of the first with the certainty of the second, and the uncertainty of the second with the certainty of the first one. Uh, um, this computation um, applies for all except for the last one, which is the uncertainty. You have to divide it by some uh, constant, in this case is three. Uh, and, yeah, and, and there you have it. You don't need to compute the, the k expression explicitly on this factor. You can also, which is a, oops, sorry, uh, you can normalize it by uh, summing all the, computing the sum of all the values and divide it by that. This is easier to, than computing this k. So this is the Dempster rule. And we can, for example, uh, in this uh, one, create another, uh, a random mass sign function and then computing the denser uh, rule. Yeah. 
So uh, maybe we can. Yeah, so we have here uh, one mass assign function created by this uh, random uh, function, another one, and then you have the combination of these two using the Dempsey rule. So uh, the combination is uh, these values, the, the um, a, a certain t's increase, but I forgot to normalize them. Yeah, this is the value. And uh, so we have implemented the Dempster rule using the mathematical definition uh, of that, right? And the final, uh, no, the one, the next um, um, function that we have here, it's chain um, Dempster rule, yeah? that allows us to pass an array of masses, a list of masses, and it computes the Dempster rule for all of them. So uh, instead of doing this uh, one by one, we can now, for example, create three masses, put them into an array, and apply the Dempster uh, rule to all of them. So we combine these three uh, with one uh, function, right, which is here. And the final one, now the next one, is the probability transformation, uh, which is the other, the other formula that I showed you here, this one. Uh, it's implemented there, uh, which is the mass of all except the, the uncertainty divided by this which is, yeah, if you do the computation, you will find that this is the constant that you have to, to divide to. So very simple, and we have um, another one to uh, one hot, one uh, uh, array. We will be reviewing this in a moment, but uh, the, this transformation, for example, we can apply them to the final, um, for example, the after combining all of these three masses, we can compute the probability transformation, and now we have uh, one value for each, uh, uh, for each class, which is a probability distribution uh, for, for there, for, for this class. So uh, we um, don't have the uncertainty here, but this is what the models need to be, to, to classify, right? Yeah, so. Uh, this is all the Dempster Sheffer theory that we need. So we can start uh, uh, using it in a real example. Yeah, we will be using the same data set as before, the uh, Iris data set. But in this case, we will be uh, doing all the step by one, one by one by. Yeah. So the first. Um, thing that we need for our model, uh, if you remember, is to create a rule set, yeah? And a rule set is a collection of masses that are associated with some uh, condition, right? In this case, for this uh, simple example, we'll be creating eight uh, random mass assign functions, right? And let me, I uh, showed you this before. So, so the rule set is this, eight uh, mass assign functions put in, in an array, yeah. And uh, we will have this function that selects the mass assign function depending on a uh, record, yeah. So this select rule, if you remember the model, I don't know if I have the model here. Yeah, maybe it's not there. Yeah, but anyway, um, you need to define a function where if you pass a record, it uh, output a subset of the rule set or uh, you seen with just the rules that applies for uh, that record or are true for that record, right? In this case, this function is uh, also very simple. We are not using um, 
uh, um, any condition, we are fixing the condition of the rules to be lower or greater than the mean of each column, right? So we have our data set here, right? It has four attributes. Yeah. For each of these attributes, we will we'll be having two rules. Yeah. Uh, if it is less than the mean of this value, we will be using one rule. And if it's greater, we will be using the other rule. And we uh, do the same for all of these uh, four uh, attributes. That's why we have eight mass assigned function because we need two uh, per attribute. And this uh, function, what it does, it iterates over the, the attributes, yeah, all of these four, and it uh, verify if the, um, the record, the value of the record in this attribute is lower than the mean of the attribute, of the column, right? And if it, this is true, we are uh, give, putting the one rule of the data set, the two uh, I rule, the two I um, uh, in the position two I rule, right? And if not, we are um, appending to this uh, rule set the, the rule in the position two I plus one, right? So Imagine that you have the eight rules in this uh, distribution. If we we are selecting basically this, for example, this and this and this for a record, we are selecting four of the of the of the eight depending on the on the value. So we can see, for example, yeah, well, yeah, one sample. For example, uh, let me show you. Uh, yeah, here we have one sample, right, with some value for the attribute. If we uh, apply the select rule to this sample, uh, what we get is a subset of the rule set, right? This is the full rule set, this is a subset, uh, and this is the rule that applies for this rule, yeah, the, the first step. If we uh, change it to another record, we had some other values, we, have, we will have a different, or we should have a different um, rule set, right? So this is the, the first step of the model. Uh, let me see if I can, yeah, here it is. So, yeah, we are here. We have defined a rule set, eight rules, and we uh, uh, have defined this function to select the rule, to select a subset of the, uh, of the rules. So the next step is when we have the subset, we can combine with the rule. We already have a method to, for that, which is change the S rule, right? So if we apply change the S rule to the select of of an anti of a record, sorry, yeah. Instead of uh, giving me the subset of the rule set, it gives the combination of the subset of the rule set. And here we have so one a, a, one mass assigned function for the combination with some values. And the next is is to yeah. So we have uh, this. Uh, combination and the next is to find the uh, the probability distribution and we also have a method for that which is prop distribution right prop transform sorry um, and if we apply that we finally get this uh, uh, probability distribution for the for this record yeah so we start with a record we produce an output Right, and we can, for example, for this, we can compute the arg max, or the, the maximum, for example, is this, and we can say that, okay, this record is from class three. Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
yeah, now that we have uh, our, our prediction process, uh, right? This is obviously very uh, bad because these are random values. Like in the first iteration of the linear regression that we did before, uh, they are fixed value random values that doesn't uh, or haven't learned anything about the data. But we can do the learning process uh, now. So um, we can we are splitting the data set into the training and testing set, the same as before, and here we have the training process. So in the training process, we are uh, doing the same as uh, before, right? Um, let's start in this line. Uh, we compute what we did in the last cell, right? Uh, this one, which is the prediction, which is the probability transformation of the chain of Dempster rule of the selection of my record, yeah? So this give us the uh, an array with the uh, probability distribution just like that. And we uh, compute the uh, one whole encoding of the um, uh, real uh, class, right? Which is, for example, if this is uh, one, which belongs to the class one, uh, what uh, it does one hot is to give you uh, um, an array with a one here and zero zero in the other uh, other two. If 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 y is two, for example, it will say zero one zero and it's fifth three or it is zero zero one, right? So uh, having these two, we can compute the loss. It's the same formula as before. Yeah, we can compute the difference between the prediction and the real value, square and taking the mean, and uh, we can uh, go backward um, in this uh, with this loss. Yeah, the only difference here uh, is that we are using uh, Adam optimization instead of. Uh, Naive uh, gradient descent as before. Um, for that, we need to. We are using the Adam implementation that Torch provides. Um, we need to say which are our parameters. In our case, it's the rule set, the learning rate, the initial learning rate. Uh, with this uh, method, a step, it will be update the values of all uh, of the parameters. Yeah. So this procedure. We repeat for all of the records in the training set. Yeah, this is the, the inner port. And we repeat this several times, which is the outer four for uh, 50 iterations. So if we, uh, before doing this, I, no, yeah, I, if we do this, we can see that the loss uh, is decreasing over the iterations and it reach some a uh, final value here right uh, and as you can see it's very slow also <laughs> because of the implementation yeah and if we see the new rule set it's very different than the rule set before yeah the value have changed to uh, to new values that may be optimal for this um, for this uh, task, right? Uh, we can test this. Uh, we can, uh, for example, make the prediction uh, of all the testing um, uh, records. I'm putting into array an array. So here we have the predicted classes for all of the testing set, and we can use any uh, metric to report the classification. So this very simple, naive uh, um, implementation reaches an accuracy of 77, right? Yeah, not so bad for, the <laughs> for doing in 10 minutes <laughs> and by hand, by scratch. Yeah, that's so not so bad, not so good. There are a lot of room to improvement here. But 
we have done a new model. This is not an artificial neural network. This is not something that you import and you use. It, it doesn't even have a fit and predict method. All was done by hand, right? So uh, this is an introduction to where how the, the model works, right? Under the hood, it is very similar to this, but it handles very many edge cases and we have another tricks to uh, to improve the the performance. For example, this loop took a lot. Uh, we have uh, we can make computation faster, but this uh, this is basically it. The, it's an introduction to what you can do. Uh, we put here the Dempster Sheffer definitions and rules and all the stuff, but you can bring another mathematical framework, another mathematical modeling for a problem, you can set up parameters, create your own model, and train them using this methodology. It's, it will be the very, very similar. Yeah, so this is the presentation. I think I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question and uh, this is because uh, yeah if you see there are minus values here and here and in but uh, in our, uh, say, uh, this is because when we are optimizing these values in this loop uh, uh, we are not forcing them to be positive or to be any any or, or to have any restrictions so the optimizers uh, uh, said that the optimal value is uh, this, minus, minus zero, zero, 005, yeah? Uh, the optimizer obviously doesn't know anything about them search effort and restriction, and we have to apply them uh, manually. So after, for example, this step, we uh, probably need to check if the constraints are, um, are yeah, hold or not, and, and fix them if needed. Yeah, by hand. This is something that I don't uh, put here, but uh, it's in the implementation. The real implementation has this uh, constraint fixing, right? Yeah. Uh, I think it, the, it's better to do it in the intermediate steps because uh, all of these computations and result uh, make sense only if the uh, constraints are met. So if we don't have uh, this, um, you can probably have uh, some sort of problem. For example, uh, the probability distribution after all of this computation may be negative also. And that's a problem because we know that probabilities itself can be negative. So, uh, so it's better to, to fix these values uh, in the between steps, right? Yes? Yeah. Uh, but uh, after this step, you can uh, enforce these two restrictions to be positive and to the and the mass have to up up to one. Uh, you have to update all the, these two in the same process. Don't know if I answered your question. We can maybe we can see the real implementation. This is the real implementation, by the way, and you can <laughs> uh, and you can uh, check. It, these are the same, very similar uh, select rules and all the stuff. And here is the normalized uh, method. And the normalized method, what it does is, 
it clamps the values between zero and one. And after that, if the sum is less than one, it um, uh, it uh, uh, divided by the sum. And if it's not less than one, which is greater than or equal, it will divide by the sum. So after this, and we repeat this for all parameters. After this, uh, all of the condition must be true. Um, 